Hi, this is Brock Palin, and this is RCE. You can find us online with all of our old shows and RSS feed and an iTunes link at rce-cast.com. Also, head on over to iTunes and give us a couple of reviews over there. It definitely helps out the show and lets other people know what we're doing here. Also, I have Jeff Squires, who is back from a one-time-ever hiatus, um, who is helping me out again. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Brock, yeah, let's let's just say I was... Um... Let's say I was on vacation in Barbados or something exciting like that. That that, that makes a better story. Uh, this, but glad to be back. Um, and uh, this today, I think we have a pretty good, uh, pretty cool topic. It's a little departure from our normal HPC Linuxy kinds of stuff, but it's a very related topic. Kind of, kind of strays into the whole I/O field, and that is a big deal for all of us. So, something we're talking about today. Yeah, we're moving into. I mean. When a lot of people talk about in our industry about big data, these guys definitely have big data, but it's a different kind of approach. So let me go ahead and introduce our guest today. Our guest today is Scott Long from Netflix, and we're going to be focusing on something new that Netflix is doing to try to make their service better. So Scott, might take a moment to introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, Brock. Thanks a lot. Um, And thank you, Jeff, also. So my name is Scott Long, and I work at Netflix. Um... Previously to Netflix, I've been there for about eight months, but previously I was at Yahoo for about five years working on their uh, operating system infrastructure. And prior to that, I've done uh, years, many years at places like Adaptech and uh, other storage companies that have uh, been specializing in basically drivers, storage infrastructure, low-level stuff like that. Um, outside of work, uh, I've been a very active member of the FreeBSD community for about uh, 12 or 13 years now. I was the release engineer for a number of years. Um, and prior to that, I actually attended University of, University of Michigan briefly in the early 90s. Um, and I now have a degree in uh, actually aviation science of all things, but uh, I still do computers as my day job. So that's that's about it for, for me for background. Okay. Well, thank you. And, you know, being a U of M person myself, it was actually when you came out and gave this exact same bit of material to a number of students here and faculty at the University of Michigan and gave me ideas like, hey, this fits right into like what a lot of people who listen to our show would be interested about. Yeah, and I would have to too that you're, you're in good company because uh, Brock, you're like a nuclear physicist or something. I studied nuclear engineering um, and yeah, I was looking for a summer job and started doing swapping CPUs in old burnout clusters and here I've been ever since. Yeah, I have a BA in English. Can you believe it? <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> I was actually an airline pilot for about six months last year, but uh, gave it up. Oh, wow. All right, so we're coming from quite the diverse background, but that brings different perspectives to computing. So this is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the actual thing we're talking about, um, Netflix kind of has is known for DVDs in the mail. Um, we're going to be focusing on the streaming service, which has been kind of a growing part of the business. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Netflix streaming and some of the challenges you guys have? So, yeah, um, as you said, you know, Netflix's original business was DVD by mail. And part of what made Netflix so good at that was understanding the data science of that, that it's not just about putting a DVD into the mail, it's also about knowing how many DVDs to inventory um, and and how to pre-stage those, those DVDs out throughout the country into distribution centers so they could quickly get to customers. <clears throat> and that was all very much, you know, data science and, and data analysis, and that's what they got very good at over time. Uh, about five years ago, uh, it was becoming very clear that the DVD business would not last forever, obviously, and that it was time to get into streaming, so they... They took some of their data science knowledge and applied it into into streaming, um, licensing the same content that they were getting in physical media and hosting it in the same Amazon cloud services that they were using for their their uh, DVD sciences and getting out to customers. And um, it's been a growing thing ever since, uh, and it's been growing so much that we're actually starting to take some new directions with that and and. Instead of having everything be hosted in the Amazon uh, web services and distributed over the, the content delivery networks like Akamai and Level 3, and I, I'll talk more about those in a little bit, we're actually starting to take a lot of that in-house uh, in order to help ourselves grow more and, and optimize for, for better ser- service and better customer experience. 
so how much data are, are we talking about here? I mean, video is kind of, you know, the next generation internet. My company, I work for Cisco, has done big bets on video and has made a lot of predictions on how much video is and where it's driving the network and things like that. But how much data do you guys stream, say, per day, per month, something like that? Um, I actually can't give a good numerical value, but what I can tell you is that we – stream over 33% of the internet's peak traffic during peak times. So, um, so 33% of a ginormous number is basically what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, to put that in, into, in, into a little bit of perspective, um, you know, the old saying was that, uh, you know, pornography actually is what, is what drove the adoption of many technologies over the years of VCRs and then DVDs and the internet and dial up to, to DSL, the cable and all that kind of stuff. Um, movie streaming in terms of things like YouTube and Netflix and Hulu have actually eclipsed that original segment by a large factor now. And, and, and now, you know, the actual TV shows and movies that we're streaming is, is, you know, makes up, uh, you know, when, when you add all sorts of together, over fifty percent of the internet, whereas uh, that pornography is now just a small fraction. So that gives you gives you an idea of how much things have grown just in the last five years, and now services like Netflix and Netflix especially are really what's driving technology. So if I've got a device at home and I've got a Netflix streaming account, what exactly is the process of, you mentioned Amazon, web services in there, and so, you know, where do the bits, where does all the hardware and where does stuff come from? All right, so there's really two sources of what's going, of what is going on. First source is that when you bring up your, your client or your web browser to, to go to Netflix to choose a movie, that's going to go out to the Amazon Web Services, and those those services are, might be on the East Coast or on the Web or on the West Coast or in some data center in between. But you'll go there and you'll pull down the selection of movies, and you'll be able to browse through and even see some clips, all that kind of stuff. That's all coming from Amazon. Um, but the next big step is when you actually go to play a movie, and and the first thing that happens there is um, when you when you select a movie, you go back to the Amazon Web Services to exchange some keys. Um, it's, you know, basically encryption key type of stuff. All right. So along those lines, uh, you talk about, well, wait a minute, actually, I'm sorry, Brock was IMing me in the middle. Did you say anything about your, uh, Amazon? Like you pick which Amazon center you end up coming from? Oh, so, uh, which center you come from is really based on your geography. Uh, you know, the, the, the big networks out there have a big database of, of everyone's ISP and approximately what geography, geographical location they're coming from. So, you know, based on DNS, based on IP address, that kind of stuff. So you, you get directed to, to the closest reasonable Amazon center for, for your geography. All right, interesting. So, so you're basing off locality. Do you also base off what kind of network they're coming in off of? So like mobile versus broadband and these kinds of things? And do you pre-stage different movie formats and resolutions and whatnot to match? So when it's just getting the movie started, no. But... So the next step for, for playing the movie, like I said, is, is, is you actually hit the play button, you exchange some keys with Amazon, and then Amazon sends you, your client, out a list of servers that it thinks you should contact in order to start getting the bits. And those, that list of servers is based on your geography. It might be based on your client. It might be based on what kind of network you're on, whether it's the cell network or, I, or DSL or cable modem. Uh, there's a lot of decision-making that goes into that. But in the end, you get a list of servers and basically a list of files because all, because all the streaming is is just uh, pulling down HTTP content. Um, so, yeah, so um, – and then you start streaming. Okay, and, and one of the big things that you're doing now and that we're specifically talking about today is that you're pushing down some of this content even lower, right? So you're not just doing everything in the Amazon cloud now. You're pushing it down uh, to the ISP level? Right. So there's a couple of reasons for that. First one was that, you know, while we had this great network of content delivery networks of, of third party networks that were that were delivering the content to the to the local regions, the ISPs were still complaining that they were getting killed by our traffic, that, you know, especially some of the smaller ISPs were were having a huge percentage of the traffic being Netflix and it was costing them a bundle to link up to the upstream where, where the uh, where the content was. So we started having this idea that Maybe it would make sense to to try and get uh, the data closer into the ISPs, especially 
um, yeah, especially the ones where, where there's enough traffic for it to really make sense for, for it to be mutually beneficial. Okay, so you've gone from having no data centers and running everything in some sort of other, you know, operation service provider to you're putting actual physical boxes with disks in them in local ISPs all around the country, and I understand heavily in Europe also. Like, it, like what's the makeup of these boxes, and what do they really do? So the boxes can be seen as kind of a building block type of thing. Um, one box can hold about... 10% of our library and we'll place one or more boxes into an ISP or into a, a, a larger regional data center based on our, our traffic and our content needs. Um, you know, the boxes can be, can be built out horizontally to serve more clients, the same data, or they can be built up vertically to serve the whole library to, to, uh, to a, a given set of clients, or they can be built down both directions to make a, a big super cluster that can serve a whole region. So what's the hardware makeup of, of, of let's say I'm, you know, a, a tiny, relatively local ISP in the Midwest in the United States. Um, what kind of box would you deploy there? Like what kind of storage and things like that? So we have really one kind of box. That's it. We're working on a second one, but I can't talk a whole lot about that right now. But basically the main box that we're deploying right now, it's a PC box. It's it's a 19-inch Chassis, um, fairly uh, fairly customized because we want to be able to fit into uh, small data centers and, and telco data centers, that kind of stuff. So it, so it's, it's not very deep. It's very compact. Uh, it's about four U, four U tall, and it holds 46 hard drives, uh, 36 spinning drives, and um, six SSDs. And how much storage total are we, are we talking here? Uh, we're talking about 120, 130 terabytes of storage. All right. Do you use redundancy or RAID or any kind of thing like that? Or if the box crashes, it's gone? So we do have a mirrored boot volume. Uh, you know, Obviously, you don't want to lose, lose, the, lose the boot volume and have the whole machine be offline. But beyond that, we actually don't mirror or stripe or anything like that at all. Each disk acts as its own independent file system. And we do that very much for reliability. We don't, we don't want to have one disk go down and bring down a whole stripe of, of disk with it. At the same time, we don't want to pay the, the storage overhead of redundancy because, like I said, this is supposed to be a very compact box. We're supposed to be getting as many bits into it as possible. And for mirroring every drive or you know, striping parity across uh, a set of drives, we're losing capacity. So do you have these boxes foaming, phoning home and you have people running around the country swapping out disks in them all the time as they fail? Or do you just, a cache keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller until you decide it's time to ship them a new box? It's pretty much a cache keeps on getting smaller and smaller and smaller. We do have an operations team that, that does monitor the performance of the caches. Uh, likewise, there's alg- algorithms in Amazon that are also automatically monitoring the health of the box. But really what happens is that if a disk dies that disc happens, happens to hold, you know, X number of movies. And when that disc dies, those movies are no longer available from that cache. So your client then goes, find, goes and finds another machine that does have those movies. Okay, so how is a client deciding which cache to talk to? Is it just like a, a DNS thing, or is your control backplane actually telling it, hey, talk to this thing first? Yep. So it gets the list from the control backplane. The backplane is monitoring the health of all the machines. Like I said, there's those algorithms going on that are constantly monitoring. So, um, so yeah. So that control backplane just always has a list of of candidate machines that it sends out to the clients, and the clients just go through that list. And if they if they run up to to the end of the list, and they go back to the to the backplane and and ask for a new list. So how do you decide what to cache uh, and and where? Is it very much based on demand so if you know 20 people are asking for a movie you'll cash it down there or do you ever let some go upstream or do you always try to cash what kind of strategies do you use it depends on the size of the of the deployment um like i said for some ISP, some isps might only get one box and that one box will cash even though it's only about 10 percent of our library it'll be able to handle about 80% of the traffic because it's the whole popularity versus long tail type of problem. So that's part of our survey when we, when we, when we talk to an ISP of, of seeing how much traffic they have and what their, what their mix is. But the other part of it is that, once again, data science in, 
in Amazon will sit and look at the popularity of content on a day by day basis and will shuffle the content around on each box at night during a during a fill window. So new movies get get brought in, unpopular movies get deleted, and we, we just automatically shift things around that, that way based on what we think is going to be popular the next day. Now here's a, a, a non technical question. So if you're preloading um, movies onto boxes in, in different localities, potentially even different countries with different laws and copyright issues and things like that. Are there different legal issues about where that movie can come from or what format it's in or or, or things like that that all has to be taken into account by your control back claim? Um, not in real time so much as when we go into a country, we work all that stuff out ahead of time. <coughs> so it's, it's, it's mostly in licensing with the movie studios and with the studio representatives in each country, you know, exactly what those, those parameters are going to be. So that's why we, it, it's hard to expand very quickly. It's not just a hardware issue. It's also we have to go to every single com- country and work out its laws, work out its licensing restrictions, and work out its, its representatives from the movie studios. So um, luckily places like Scandinavia have been very receptive and very you know, relatively easy to work with. Um, but there may be other countries that aren't as receptive and aren't as easy to work with, and we won't show up there as soon. So you mentioned that a, a single of one of these 4U caches holds about 10% of your library right now, and I assume that's before the Ultra HD or 4K or whatever it is you guys just announced, which I want to touch on later. Mm-hmm. That doesn't tell how many like IOP kind of needs, like how many actual people demanding streams can one of these things serve. So that is part of what I do is optimizing that. Um, right now, one box can serve, we'll say about 10,000 customers at one time, 10,000 streams at one time. Um, but there's a little bit of variability into it because uh, because of basically different clients and different bit rates. Your, your movie streaming to your iPhone or your iPad is going to be a lower bit rate than uh, someone going to your desktop PC. So... Um, really what we, what we think about more in, ter- in terms of is maximum bandwidth. And right now these machines have two 10 gigabit uh, Ethernet links on them. We try and fill those links up. And that might be 10,000 customers, might be 15,000 customers if they're all lower bandwidth customers. Okay, so that's the only metric? Like as long as we say a cache can only push out this much out its 10 gig interface and when it gets to 90% of that, we stop sending clients to that cache? It's a little more complicated than that. Um, the control backplane is constantly looking at the health of the cache. And by health, it's looking at things like latency. It's looking at, at um, latency on the, on the network interface, latency on the disk interface. Also, each client that's streaming a movie is also phoning back to the backplane and, and telling it how, how good quality of, of bits it's getting from its server. So between all those metrics and, and, and all that monitoring, the backplane starts to make decisions and says... You know, it, it, it'll see that the server is starting to get overloaded, that it's starting to drop packets, or its service latency is getting too high, and it'll start to uh, shift away from that server and, and, and try and rebalance away from it. Now, you mentioned that you have a bunch of uh, spindles on the machine and you have some SSDs. What do you use the different technologies for? So the spindles are all three and four terabyte drives, and you know, obviously as hard drives get bigger, we'll be adopting those to get as much storage as we can. And that's really for holding the majority of our content. Um, the SSDs are really for getting more IOPS out of it. So the SSDs really just mirror what's on the hard drives, but they um, they mirror you know the super hot content, the really popular stuff that we we expect to have a lot of streams going off of at once. And for that <laughs> level of decision inside the box of spinning Rust versus you know um, flash disk, what? Is that also like predetermined ahead of time and placed onto there, or does the box actually make a decision? I'm going to start moving this up to SSD. Um, the box, when it gets its manifest from from the backplane of what movies to get, that that manifest is also sorted by popularity. So the box will take a look at how much space it has on the SSD scan because once again, an SSD might fail too. The box will take a look at, at what how much space it has, and it'll it'll manually shift stuff over based on what it sees in the manifest. So we talked about the the hardware in here. You got two ten gig. You got a bunch of spindles. You got some SSD, and it's being told what to 
have locally. It's being pushed to it by the backplane. What software does the actual appliance run? So our operating system is FreeBSD, and we use a web server called Nginx to push out all the bits. All, all of our streaming is actually HTTP streaming. It's not a special protocol, and we just use pretty much a standard web server. Uh, we chose Nginx. All right, so why do you use Nginx? Why not the canonical Apache? Nginx is uh, well-known for being very lightweight. It doesn't have all the baggage that Apache has grown over the years, um, but it's also very asynchronous. We can have thousands of, of uh, active requests going on at once without having to have a thousand, of, thousand threads back in those requests. So um, that was really the big thing. You know, we knew that we'd have tens of thousands of, of, of clients at once. And um, since it's all static content also, we didn't need to have all the, all the fancy Apache modules to do it. So it really made sense from, from, from that economy, economy. All right. Now, you mentioned earlier, too, um, that uh, a machine looks at its manifest and whatnot. So let me dive a little deeper on that. How does... What, what do you ship to an ISP? Do you ship something preloaded or do you ship basically an empty box with some kind of unique identifier and when it phones home, you know, the back plane says, oh, here's the, you know, 10% of the database you're supposed to have or, or these 10 things are going to, you know, what, what's the protocol for bringing up a new machine once it's uh, physically co-load? Um, we really just pretty much ship it to the ISP. We rely on, on them to install it. Uh, we try and make everything as easy to install as possible. It's just a matter of plugging in power, plugging in the network, and then bringing up a, 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 a login console locally to set, the, set things like the IP address and routing parameters. Uh, and then once it's up, yeah, that machine phones home, and, and we can figure it with its uh, Netflix uh, cache ID, and, and then it starts filling. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that this isn't just going to ISPs. This is also going into major data centers, too. And for the major data center stuff, we're actually the ones that, are, that own those machines and configure them. And, you know, we've, we've, we've talked a little bit about uh, trying to preload those. But, um, but yeah, for, for the small ISPs, it's very much we ask the ISP just to unbox it, put it in a rack, and plug it in, and, and they're done. Now, when you say major data center, what exactly – by that, do you mean like a, a Time Warner? Like uh, they serve an ISP of a, a ten-state area, or or what? You know, we still can consider those to be ISPs. What well, what we mean by a major data center is the major network concentration ports points around the country. Um, you know, the old May May West and May East in San Jose and in New York, and you know, data centers where where a lot of bandwidth comes together and, and an aggregates and go back goes back out. So we're actually buying rack space in those data centers and, and those big exchange points and building huge clusters of machines that we own and we operate ourselves. And then we are offering peering out to ISPs, ISPs that maybe are too small to justify us giving them a box or ISPs that for whatever reason don't want a box. So we basically part, you know, partner the bandwidth be- between us at those peering points and those, those other ISPs and control everything ourselves. So what kind of real savings are we talking about here to these, you know, these last mile, you know, network providers? What's one of these boxes really kind of equating around a country? Um, we offer the boxes for free to the ISPs that we give them to. So it costs them nothing. And we, we, we tell them that, you know, with an embedded box in their data center, they could save 80% of their traffic, or if they have multiple boxes, maybe 90% of their traffic. And when you talk about, you know, us being a third of, of, of their overall traffic, that's a significant amount of savings for them. Um, for the other kinds of installations where where the machine is, is at one of our data centers um, or one of our racks, and, and we peer to them, um, once again, it's a pretty similar savings in that, uh, you know, we're 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 partnering on the bandwidth costs between us and them. So the bits that we send down, the bits that they ask for from us, pretty much uh, even out. And once again, they get a, a very significant savings from partnering with us. Okay. So what about the challenge of you? You went from having no servers, no data centers, everything's hosted by a third party. It's really just your you know your sauce and your licensing deals. To you have 
machines you own around the country in multiple places, and then you have machines that you're kind of responsible for for security updates and everything else hosted in third-party places you don't have access to. What's been the challenges and everything else of dealing with this? So um, big challenge when it comes to especially those those embed caches that we don't own that we give to the ISPs is making sure that we have some sort of a reliable back channel so that if the machine does go down, we can get into it. Um, and that's actually been, been a big topic recently um, that we've been working on is, is, is making sure that if the network link goes down, that the other link is available on, on the second port. Or if, a, or if the ISP only has one, one port hooked up, they only want one 10 gig port hooked up, uh, trying to figure out what we do with that if that one link goes down. So that is a bit of a challenge. Um, so part of our job is to make machines as reliable as possible, that if it does crash, it comes back up, but obviously we don't want it to crash at all. So um, thing, so that's why we do have an operations team that is monitoring the performance of all machines all the time so that we can be predictive about when a machine might have problems and we can take it offline for that ISP or we can alert them and tell them that you know, we need them to, to do something for us. Now, how distributed is the control of of your machines? Um, let's say here's a, f- a fictitious but probably not unrealistic scenario: some ISP or data center has uh, two or three or more of your caching boxes there, and for some reason, let's say the the ISP goes off the air, right? They lose their general internet connectivity, and your machines lose connectivity to the mothership. Mm-hmm. Can they still function? Um, do they coordinate between each other at all? These kinds of things. They they can't actually. They really need to be able to talk to the backplane um, all the time. And if they if they do lose connectivity to the backplane, um, if they lose connectivity to the backplane, then, then presumably the whole ISP has lost connectivity. You know, there's been sort of some sort of network outage, and which means that, that if the clients can't talk to the backplane, then then they're not going to be getting the, the the decryption keys to watch the movies anyway. So it's, it's kind of a Kind of a, kind of a, a done deal. If 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 you're watching a movie and in the middle of watching that movie the backplane goes down, um, you, I think you can still watch to the end of the movie, but you can't start anything new. So, are the movies held on to cache or even in your you know you could say like your your root your, your original source for all the content? Is it one file per movie per bit rate per format, or are they like broken in multiple pieces? Like we're talking about very large files, we're talking about very small files, we're talking about you know what what really happens here. So um, the movies, each video bit rate has a different format, or it has a different file. Each video uh, format has a different file. So your your iPod and your your Android tablets will have one certain kind of format. Um, your that's that's different from uh, your PCs or, or your PS3s or your your Wii, and a lot of that's driven by technology um, of those different platforms, and some of it relates to the to the to the bit rate. So what it comes down to is that each movie might have as many as as seven or ten different video files associated with it, and your client picks the one that's most appropriate for it. Um, the audio also gets stored as a separate file, and. Things like uh, previews, if, if you want to scan ahead and see screen, screen captures of, of scanning ahead or scanning behind, those will be stored as a different file also. Okay, so then it sounds like the, the content caches, you know, as you put those out, those are kind of infinitely scalable as long as there's enough network bandwidth there. You just keep plopping down more, you've got more capacity. But everything's got to be talking back to this backplane. I assume the backplane's got to do the check to see, can you actually ask this? And everything else is the backplane actually the thing that you have to worry about scaling more than anything else. Uh, scaling not so much because the great thing about Amazon is that we can always put more instances of machines online, um, and our, our protocol has has always been designed to be very scalable in that respect. So, you know, as as our customer base grows, we just put more instances of, of backplane machines online in, in AWS, and everything works. Uh, where we do have problems is when uh, we have outages from Amazon, and that's something that you know it happened right before Christmas. It happened a few months prior. That's something that we're, we've become very sensitive to, and we're working to build more resiliency into that by you know basically working better with Amazon to to, to make sure that doesn't happen. 
So you've got all these machines all around. How, what software do you use to manage them? Just to manage, you know, uh, putting images out there and just, you know, the the day to day system administration of things. Do you use any popular software for that, or is this all a homegrown solution? It's all very much homegrown. Um, when it comes to uh, like data analysis and visualization, there are some packages that we use that I, I apologize, I can't think of off the name of the top of my head, but um, that's just not my area. But when it comes to like um, deploying uh, new images or, 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 or upgrading an OS, that's all homegrown tools. Okay, so is there more plans? You mentioned you were working on a second box. And you don't have a whole lot to say about that, but what are the future things for trying to improve the Netflix streaming service, this ultra-high HD thing that will, I guess, require one of these caches? Am I correct the way I was reading that? That is correct. Um, so our, our plan is always to, to get bigger and do it more efficiently. So as, as, as we talked about at the beginning, um, all the streaming has come originally from the content delivery networks, the places like Akamai Level 3 that, that cache a lot of data from places like Google or, or Yahoo or Facebook. They also cache our data. So we are actually starting to move off of those, uh, not, just to, not just to help all the smaller ISPs, but also to help our scalability. We're starting to move off of those, and the work for the foreseeable future is going to be making our own network uh, faster, more reliable, cheaper, all that kind of stuff. So the super high HD, how is that going to kind of impact these caches? Either the amount of content they can hold, or how many people they can service, or like network connections. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much you, you touched on it right there. With the question is that um, the video files are going to get bigger. So you know, in the long run, as we uh, as we reencode now. As we re-encode, we're also using the H.265 codec now instead of H.264. So that's giving us better compression with better quality at the same time. So going to, to super high def isn't quite as much of a bandwidth hog as, as it might seem, but it still does does uh, increase our, our, our bandwidth overhead. So um, so yeah, over time, you know, one cache may, may only hold 8% of our library instead of 10% or even less than that. So we've got to be able to scale to have more more machines out there to serve the same customer base. Um, and likewise, higher bandwidth, um, we're looking to, to be able to expand beyond two ports on a box to three or four ports on a box and have that one box be able to serve, you know, maybe the same customer with a higher bandwidth or, you know, give and take along those lines. Here's a random question that I, I like to ask a lot of software developers, and it's purely a curiosity question uh, on, on my part since I'm a software developer myself. You guys have developed a lot of this homegrown software for the control plane and for the sysadmin and all these kinds of things. Uh, what version control system do you guys use to maintain all your stuff and why? I just, I just love to hear people's different answers to this. So the main system that we use in Netflix is Perforce. And honestly, I can't tell you why that it was. It, it predates me by quite a long time, um, but that's that's what's used for all you know all of our clients and all of our control software and pretty much ninety nine percent of the business. Um, for us in Open Connect and, and the software that actually goes into our cache boxes, we're using Subversion. And the reason that we're using Subversion is that once again we're based off of FreeBSD, and FreeBSD uses Subversion as its native source control, so it, it makes it. For us to use it too makes it very easy to to integrate and be able to pull upstream changes from FreeBSD.org. Can you touch a little bit on your open source involvement? I, you guys are using BSD. You were a BSD release maintainer. Um, what, Netflix has released a number of their in-house tools. Can you touch on that? Kind of like your philosophy and how you interact with like the BSD project as you fix network driver bugs. It's been a very very good relationship. Um, and, and, you know, I have a lot of history. Uh, we've hired a number of people at Netflix that have history with BSD. Um, so so we're not reaching out to BSD so much as, as we're just integrating with the community. We try and get, we try and push as many of our changes out to the community as we can. Um, it, and it makes our life easier by, to do that. We don't want to carry huge patch sets to our code base that become harder and harder to maintain over time. 
we want to get everything out. We really have no secret sauce other than like our control plane stuff, but that's not part of part of the OS. So as far as the OS goes, we push out as much as we can, and in return, we get a lot of involvement from the community, both you know people who are interested and and, and motivated to help us, but also um, we can we can find problems that are affecting the community and, and, and work together with the community to get those problems solved. So what's the most popular content being served out there? I'm sure you guys are these heavy duty data science people, and maybe we should get some of your data science people to talk about that aspect of Netflix. What's the most popular thing? Is it the thing that's the most expensive for you to license or is it something strange and odd? Well, you know, obviously blockbusters are, are always popular, but um, really what's driving us is My Little Pony and SpongeBob because that stuff is, is easy to license. It's, it's, it's cheap to license and kids love it. And uh, yeah, you know, during the day we get a lot of traffic from kids watching My Little Pony or, you know, adults watching My Little Pony. <laughs> okay scott well thank you very much for your time this was very informative a little outside our normal area but i think people are going to like this a lot especially anybody who's looking at how you would manage an extremely large infrastructure uh thanks again for your time and this will be up soon all right thank you very thanks, much scott. you're welcome have a good day